Why does North Korea want the bomb? It's a million dollar question considering what's going on nowadays. See, the Winter Olympic game is being held in Pyeongchang, South Korea, but the North Korean nuclear issue is stealing all kinds of attentions from the media. I get all kinds of questions, what's going to happen next? Well, who knows what's going to happen, but based on political theories, I'm trying to analyze. Robert McNamara, State Secretary during the Kennedy and Johnson administration, said in an interview for the documentary, The Fog of War, we were successful in the, uh, uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis because we were able to get under their skin, but we did not do so in Vietnam. See, in order to understand foreign policy making the other's uh, intention, you have to understand the history and what motivations they have. To this end, I look at the history of North Korea's nuclear programs as it was developed over three generations of leaders. See, it started uh, during the Korean War. After the US joined the Korean War, uh, see, they pushed all the way to the uh, Yalu River, which is the Chinese border. I believe that the time that North Korean leader Kim Il-sung started thinking about nuclear weapons, the base of my thinking is North Korea, right after the end of the Korean War, asked the Soviets to share nuclear weapons. That is the key point, right after the Korean War. One can raise a question, then they could have asked for nuclear technology for electric purposes. No way, based on the history, because in 1963, the Soviets, for the first time, started having elect uh, nuclear facility for electricity purposes. So it was not the case that North Korea wanted nuclear weapons for power purposes as they claimed in the past. See, over time period, South Korea developed their economies, even though North Korea did not. Based on the capitalist market system, South Korea employed export-oriented industrialization policy, and their economy took off. But with the socialist system, North Korea did not. In the 90s, they experienced famines and droughts that really sunk their economies. The wealth gap between the two Koreas just started widening. Believe it or not, North Korea was much wealthier than South until 1973. That was the time period the gap started widening. And that's the time period the North Korea started worrying about South Korea observing North Korea based on economic power. This is a symbolic satellite picture that shows that South Korea has much more economic wealth with the lights and North Korea does not. As of today, South Korea's GDP is about 50 times more than North Korea's and their per capita GDP is about 22 times. With economic development, South Korea went through the transition to democracy. Democratization had multiple implications. One, there was an elite change in South Korea that was good and bad for dealing with North Korea. At the same time, the Cold War ended in the end of the 1980s. With the end of the uh, Cold War, South Korea normalized the relationship with the Soviets in 1990 and China in 1992. In 1988, one of the US satellites was taking pictures of the world and found construction in the nuclear, construct, nuclear site in Yongbyon, North Korea. And that escalated tensions. Washington pressured Moscow to have North Korea join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They did, but in the uh, inspection by the International Atomic Energy Agency, there was a discrepancy between the report and what's going on. While that was going on, Jimmy Carter visited North Korea and the settlement was made. After that, I'm getting behind the uh, screen, uh, say, uh, South Korean President Kim, uh, Kim Dae-jung came to power. He was a progressive leader and he was interested in employing engagement, but George W. Bush was not. He wanted to put pressure on North Korea. That led to friction between Seoul and Washington. In addition to that, see, in Korea, among Koreans, there were conflicts. Conservatives wanted to synchronize South Korea's North Korean policy with the United States, but progressives were not. So from North Korea's point of view, it was great that 
having nuclear weapons not only leads to friction between Seoul and Washington, but also it leads to conflict among Koreans. That's why they continue to push, and they had six different nuclear tests, and the most recent one done in September last year. That was much bigger than before. On top of that, North Korea continued to test uh, long-range missiles, which is uh, showing right there, and the most recent one, Hwasong 15, is estimated to reach the main continent of the United States. Why does it matter? if North Korea has the capability to directly hit the U.S. main continent. It's a game changer because North Korean nuclear program becomes the United States threat directly, not South Korean problems. Because of that, the U.S. has been working with the U.N. to put pressure on them. See, if North Korea becomes successful, the United States would have only two choices. One, pulling out so that it wouldn't have to be entrapped to the conflict in the Korean Peninsula. The other, the United States have a military attack. That is what's going on trying to deal with that. And so from North Korea's point of view, having nuclear weapons, that's not only for their regime to survive, but also creating frictions between Seoul and Washington, and also among Koreans, and hopefully that leads to the withdrawal of U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula. So how is it going to end? It would be one of these pictures if they are in good mood, shaking hands, trying to synchronize the approach, put pressure, or do whatever they are doing in the same manner, likely to have a successful outcome. If they disagree, frictions, and they go different ways, there could be a problem. And let's see what happens. Thank you.